Hey everyone, postgazette.com, Chris Carter, Stephen Thompson, your Pitt beat writers here. After Pitt has taken down West Virginia 38-34 in another crazy comeback, this time a 10-point comeback, they ended up winning with two touchdown drives at the end of the game. Much like last week, the offense was all over the place. They were here and there, and then all of a sudden, Eli Holstein locks in, leads the comeback, Pitt gets a big win in the backyard brawl. They are 3-0 and in this game. Steven, before we get to our good, bad, and ugly with our breakdown here on postgazette.com, this is just, I think, an impressive situation that Pitt has put itself in. Yeah, I mean, I think you think about how far the depths of, of 2023 reached. 3-9, and nine, I don't think, tells the full story. I mean, it was a miserable campaign. And then you turn around and you contrast this game, this backyard brawl, to the backyard brawl from last year. Completely different feeling. I mean, Pitt lost that game last year, but they didn't even feel competitive in this one. And I mean, you turn around and you have a historic comeback at your home stadium, mm-hmm. and, and just the vibes are completely different. I, I mean, I think yeah. this game illustrates it the most. It's it's not just the record. Pitt has a lot going for it right now. Absolutely. So let's talk about our good, bad, and ugly. My good is this historic start. Not only is this a big win for Pitt, but they are now 3-0 and in non-conference play, which I don't think the general viewer might realize. But Pitt being 3-0 and right now, they play Youngstown State next week. Youngstown State is 1-2, and and they just lost to Duquesne. They play them here. If Pitt wins that game, it will be the first time since Pitt joined a conference in 1991 that the Panthers have had an undefeated non-conference regular season start. That will be historic for this program. It won't mean that they're going to the playoffs or anything, but it will be a sign that this team has put the 3-9 the and nine season behind them. Heck, they've already matched their win total of last year going, in, going into that fourth game. And I think what's really impressive, Stephen, is all the things that – could have been a problem for Pitt. The, the offense, how fast it was, and how, 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 you know, oh, this could have made them tired. It could have made things out. In back-to-back games now, with Cincinnati's comeback, with 21 points you were down, 10 points you were down in less than five minutes uh, in, in this game, both instances, the offense and the defense had to step up in key moments to give Pitt a chance, and both times they got it done. To me, that is as impressive as anything that's, that's happened so far. Yeah, and I think you talk about momentum. I think that's the biggest mm-hmm. thing. When's the last time you can remember Pitt going into ACC play with momentum? Um, I think even the 2021 season, you had that Western Michigan loss that was kind of marring everything else. They had to come back. Right. They had to bounce back from a bad loss like that. And instead, they're heading in. They have a chance, I should say. Let's not overlook Youngstown State just yet. But they have a chance to go into ACC play with momentum, which is really huge. Absolutely. So I gave my good. What's your good from this game? My good is Eli Holstein's creativity. I mean, just like he did last week against Cincinnati, kind of getting the kick, uh, the comeback kick started, he was able to use his legs. He was able to scramble, create more time for his receivers to get open. Uh, and that led to big plays for the pit offense. And it was really, really necessary. He was able to kind of... Uh, put this team on his back, uh, for lack of a better term, in, especially in that first half when he was creating a bunch of plays for him. And the worst part, the thing is, though, as we transition into our bad, mm-hmm. uh, Eli's creativity was necessary because the offensive line did not play very well today uh, in either the run or the pass. I mean, Holstein was creating all of those opportunities with his legs, doing different things, and being really creative because he had to. I mean, he had pressure in his face right. almost all day, and they were equally as bad in the run game. I feel like Desmond Reed rarely... Uh, you know, had a run where he was not uh, handling a free rusher in the backfield before he could even get his run started. He had some nice runs, but they were really tough. They were hard-earned yards. They were. So the the offensive line really has to shape up. It has to be a lot better as they hit conference play. Yeah, absolutely. The run game non-existent for the most part. Desmond Reed, though, still two touchdowns, still a big playmaker this game, but through the passing game. And I think that's another sign that's positive for Cade Bell's offense that it can create things. But for the positive of Cade Bell's offense, we have to talk about some negatives. And I'm going to talk about, for my bad, some timely play calling or some missed time we play calling. Now, this is not to say that Cade Bell did a bad job because actually, yeah, I think he called a very good game. The fact that Pitt was able to go back out there and get a t- and, and erase another 10-point lead, it, it makes me ask the question, is any lead safe when Cade Bell and Eli Holstein are on the other team? That's a, that's a question for the future. But let's acknowledge a few things here. There were some play calls that disrupted Pitt's momentum and its, and its flow, particularly when Pitt tried to go to their trick plays. You saw the flea flicker pass, which is the second time they've tried it. Both times have resulted in disaster for Pitt. Big sacks, big pressure. They've been unable to hold those up. You also had a reverse that was flipped around, and the defense was right on it. It was a loss of eight, and it destroyed it destroyed the momentum of, of that drive. And sometimes 
West Virginia also erased some of the those mistakes with some of their bad penalties in this game. They were a very sloppy team in this game as well. But still, those calls putting them behind the eight ball. And then, of course, the fourth and one that Pitt tried at the end of the first half, trying to put some points on the board and build upon a lead. And they call a shovel pass to Kenny Johnson, and it's like, why call that when it's bunching people up in space and how you've been killing West Virginia all game long was spreading them out, letting your wide receivers run, and letting Eli Holstein say, hey, do I want to go to this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, or run the football? And when they took that away, they lost those moments. And also on defense, it flips to as well as the timely play calling. Two fourth downs. There was a fake punt. Uh, fake punts, I think, are kind of fluky, and I don't, I don't consider those as much – on coaching as much. I mean, like, there's a little bit of coaching there, but that those I don't get as up, as uh, on about as I do when it's fourth down and you know you have to get a certain down and distance to stop them. And two times, Pitt needed these stops in these games, and they get these stops, it changes the entire tone of the game. And both times, it was the same play from West Virginia. Simple outs to one side of the field and simple outs to the other side of the field. They just flipped the play both times. And both times, Pitt gave a cushion to West Virginia's slot receiver to allow that play to happen. And I, I get it. Man coverage, you don't want to get beat deep. You, want, you don't want to give up the big play. But in down a distance, you need to be prepared to defend every blade of grass that's before that marker. And in those situations, they weren't. So you have those offensive plays, you have those defensive plays that I thought weren't weren't right. Pitt found a way to erase it. And again, that you know, for all the things we're going to complain about the coaching for those play calls, they're also the coaches that set up this win, that set up the offense that led the comeback, that set up the defense that got the, the stop at the end of the game, and the special teams that blocked the punt that was returned for a touchdown. So many good things that the coaching staff does. But if I'm going to harp on one thing that's bad in this game, I'm harping on those timely plays. They need to fix that moving forward so they don't need those comebacks. Exactly, and as we transition to our uglies, that's that's my ugly. Why do we keep need to come, needing to come back? Why do we need historic comebacks? Why do we need... Uh, to have moments like this clutch, these clutch situations where, where Pitt has to kind of pull a rabbit out of that. I don't think it should have to happen anymore. I think especially going back to that, one of the plays that you highlighted, that, that shovel pass to Kenny Johnson at the end of the first half. I mean, that was a moment where Pitt had a chance to really deliver a, a haymaker, yeah. you know, to really not put this game away, but to put a stranglehold on it. And mm -hmm. they completely missed an opportunity to. Um, they give up basically a free three points to West Virginia that tied the game uh, before... Uh, the end of the first half, and I just think there are chances that Pitt has to to blow teams out, honestly, to to make wins more convincing and, and less remarkable. Uh, and so I think that's that's the biggest thing moving forward is are they able to be a little bit cleaner and start dominating some games instead of having to pull them out of the pull them out of a, pull a rabbit out of a hat? Excuse me. Oh no, absolutely no, it's fine because honestly we are flabbergasted by we have now covered two crazy comebacks from this Pitt football team and that is astounding and that's the beautiful part of things. But the ugly part of things that I'm going to harp on right now. Post game comments by both coaches. Now, one, Pat Narduzzi, immediately on the broadcast after the game, he's, he's asked on the field about the game, and he dives right into the officiating. And listen, the officiating was not good in this game by any means. It was bad. Uh, and But Pat Narduzzi took it to the level to say, We beat, mean Pitt, we beat two teams today, West Virginia. And the officials. And these are Big 12 officials. That's how it works is when you play out-of-conference opponents, there's agreement. You get the home stadium, the other team gets the officials. That happens, and, you know, there were things. But listen, West Virginia had plenty to complain about itself. There were there were some plays that they thought were ticky-tack. I think Neil Brown, the one thing he harped on was a holding play that took back a touchdown. That was holding. But I thought there were other moments that were legitimate qualms by uh, or complaints from West Virginia. But even still... Pat Narduzzi bringing it up and bringing it up that way. And listen, there were some moments that I thought were terrible. There was a touchdown that was a touchdown that put Pitt down 10. That was a terrible non-call where uh, the uh, West Virginia wide receiver grabbed Ryland Gandy, Pitt cornerback, by the face mask, yanked him to the ground as he caught the touchdown. And it was just like, a man, how do you miss that call in that situation? I get it. But Pat Narduzzi taking it there. Neil Brown was, was asked by Mike Asty after the game uh, about this. And Neil Brown, West Virginia head coach, said, that's BS. I'm going to abbreviate that because that's he said the full word there in his press conference. But he's, he, he was mad about it. He was upset. He, he called Pat Narduzzi out for it. Kind of got, you know, kind of got a little testy about it. But that's what happens with these rivalries. But still, it's a shame that... Here we are in this post-game environment of an amazing football game. Like, let's be clear. Even though there was sloppiness, even though there was craziness, this was a lot of fun to watch. It was fun for us to cover. But here we are at the end of the game, and people are talking about the refs. They're talking about these officials. And it's, it's okay to mention them, but for the head coaches, 
to be bringing it up, that to me, it brings some ugliness to the situation. Yeah, and it's a little bit about like what we talked about last week with our ugly, uh, you know, the post game scene on the field at Cincinnati. I mean, it's stuff that's unnecessary. Yeah. You know, and, and, and you don't want that to mar a really good football game or a remarkable football game, historic win, a, a great night for Pitt. Uh, and instead, we're talking about the officials at the end and talking about, you know, some post game comments. We shouldn't have to do that. Yeah, and that's why we didn't do that too much until the very end of our show because this was a spectacular scene. Also, I'd say the ending scene here was much better than the ending scene in Cincinnati where you had Cincinnati uh, uh, equipment managers trying to chase down Javon McIntyre for the final football of, of, of the game. Uh, meanwhile, this time you had Pitt's players all going right to this Pitt student section, which was packed and excited and jumping the entire game. I even talked to four Pitt students who parked outside, not parked, they slept outside the gates of Acrisure Stadium overnight, one of them in a walking boot because he recently got a toe amputated, but they did not care. They were on towels. They only each slept about an hour each. They were watching each other, making sure no one would mess with them throughout the night. They didn't get any sleep. They stayed in those positions. They were front row. I, I, I saw them last night, said hi to them, posted about them on Twitter, uh, and then I saw them front row. They were there. They remembered me. They said hi. They were so excited, and their energy was not lacking despite any sleep here. Pitt fans came to show out. It was a great environment. West Virginia fans also came to show out. Eli Holstein said that. Steven, I think we got to cover a very special moment in Pittsburgh sports history. Yeah, it feels the same as it did when we were uh, we were covering the 2022 game, and MJ Devonshire comes up with a game-winning interception. I mean, this is the type of moments that this game creates, and this is the type of moments that you should expect when the backyard brawl comes to Pittsburgh especially. Absolutely. From Chris Carter and Stephen Thompson, thank you for tuning into our post-game analysis here with the good, bad, and the ugly on YouTube and on your favorite podcasting apps. Thanks again for everyone for tuning in. Subscribe to this channel to get all the daily content that comes out from all of our Pittsburgh sports writers. Stay tuned, though, too, because tomorrow the Steelers play the Broncos, and we'll have our team of riders who are in Denver covering that game, giving you their post-game analysis, and of course, I'll be doing the North Shore Drive podcast Monday morning, getting you getting you all the recaps and analysis here. Subscribe to get all of that work in written form and in everything else at post-gazette.com. From Chris Carter and Stephen Thompson, have a great night. We'll see you soon. Thank you for checking out this content from Post Gazette Sports. If you watch this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. For all of the sports coverage the Post Gazette has to offer, visit post-gazette.com.